one of the most amazing activists I know. I know a lot of activists, and she's one of the best. Uh, she, she works on a lot of different issues from peace and on a lot of different environmental issues, and she connects things. So it's not like a tunnel vision that, that some activists have. And she organizes things, she organizes people, events, absolutely wonderful. I, I really, I would have to say I'm a fan of Ann Egan. <laughs> Thank you. Me too. Um, and um, I also want to say a, a big shout out for the people of Queens from 1962. I don't know if anybody here was in Queens in 1962, but Indian Point, which is about 40-some uh, miles from where we're sitting right now, uh, they wanted to build it in Long Island City. <laughs> That's where they originally wanted to put it. They thought it would be so cool to have a nuclear power plant right across from the United Nations. <laughs> right? When you take the 7 train or the, the uh, N train to Queensboro Plaza, you see Ravenswood, that's the site. That's where there was going to be nuclear power plants. <laughs> but the people of Queens, especially Long Island City and Astoria, got together and they stopped that plant from being put there. Yeah. So they, want, they found a place that was a little more conservative that they could uh, uh, talk into, bribe. And they put it up in Westchester on the Hudson River. Um, yeah, I do uh, Ecologic uh, every other Tuesday at 8 p.m. WBAI is 9 to 9.5 FM. There's flyers in the back. So when I say I have a face for radio, now you know. It really is true. I have a face for radio. <laughs> and I also want to commemorate the man who got me politically active, uh, named Jacob Aftel, who passed away in 1990 of melanoma. Um, I was listening to the No Nukes album and reading the book that came with it and realized I'm going to get off my duff and, and do something. I'm not going to just sort of complain about how terrible it is that they let these things happen. And I contacted all these different groups. And I went to meetings and I was so uncomfortable at these meetings. I didn't join the first several groups whose meetings I went to. And then Jacob Aftel, the way he ran the meeting, the way he ran the group, uh, the way he uh, dealt with people was so good. I said, this is where I want to be, and I joined the New York City Shad Alliance. Um, if you guys were active back in the uh, 80s, and you remember this guy with, with flaming red hair and a twinkle eye, that was Jacob Aftel. Um, passed away September of 1990. Um, and without him, I don't think I would be here right now. Um, I have a lot of topics on, on the flyer. There's a lot of aspects to Indian Point, and usually when I get to speak, I get to speak for 45 minutes or 15 minutes or whatever. Uh, this time I'm going to be taking a little more time and really going into detail. You're going to get more than I think I've ever been able to give about Indian Point uh, at any one sitting. Every day that any nuclear power plant operates, it puts radiation into the air. You have a reactor vessel, and you have uh, uranium and that's having a uh, chain reaction, putting out all kinds of, of energy that they use to boil water. And that's all a nuclear plant does, it boils water. That's it. That's the same thing that gas and coal and oil do, boils water. But the residue of these reactions accumulate in the reactor vessel. And if there's too much there, it will shut it down. So they open up a vent and out it goes into the air. And it goes wherever the wind takes it. Uh, if the people of Westchester are nearby, because this is heavy, it's, it's, it's gas, because it's at a temperature of about 5,000 degrees. Now, they, they operate between, from three to about 5,500 degrees Fahrenheit. If that plant gets uh, to 8,500 degrees, it melts. That's what happened in Fukushima. That is why they went nuts trying to keep that plant cool. Because if that thing got to 8,500 degrees, there is no way of controlling the nuclear reaction in that plant. Because the way they operate, they put boron or cadmium rods, because they call them control rods, down from the top into the reactor. And that absorbs the neutrons from the uranium fuel, and that slows down the reactor and cools it down. Well, if you melt it, how in the world are you going to put control rods in? 
Right? That reaction is now a runaway reaction. And that is why, no matter what else it did to the surrounding area, they were going to cool that plant down. That is why it's like, oh my God, they're putting water on it, and the water's going into the ocean, and it's steam and going where the wind's blowing, and what it's doing to the people of Japan, the things that live in the ocean. It'd be a whole lot worse if that plant totally melted down. Because it would melt the building it was in, it would melt the rock that it's on, it would melt everything, and every bit of radiation in that plant would go. It would be out everywhere. It would be a much worse situation than even what we saw. And because they put nuclear plants together, well, if you're going to melt down one, and there's another plant, say like an Indian point, then it's going to melt that one down. Because if it's melting the building, well, it's going to melt the next building too. That is the horrible aspect of a total meltdown. Three Mile Island in March 79 had a partial meltdown. The Fermi reactor in Detroit in the 60s had a partial meltdown. At the time, there were a lot of people who thought a meltdown was impossible. Uh, Michio Kaku, who does a science show on cable TV, started on WBAI, and he was in college when that meltdown happened. And and then he's like, this is top secret stuff, but you as people can fix it. And told him not to melt down. That's where Mishukaka went from being pro-nuclear to anti-nuclear. I started out pro-nuclear too. I think if you're pro-science, you have people coming in telling you how wonderful, how the great science, and all that nuclear power. And, you, and, and of course, they give you this little tiny piece of information when there's all this stuff missing. So I would talk to other uh, nuclear activists to try to convince them how dumb they were. And they're telling me stuff I never knew about. I, I check it. Sure enough. And so I found out that Jersey Central Power and Light lied to me for my entire childhood. <laughs> and they lied big time. And nuclear power is not a wonderful example of, of science benefiting the people. It's a wonderful example of science hurting people and making a lot of money for somebody. They used to call it too cheap to meter. And, and energy loves to threaten that if they shut down Indian Point, all your rates will go up. You know something? If Indian Point is so good for our rates, why do we have the highest rates in the country? <laughs> We've got two nuclear power plants. It should, be, it should be great for our rates. Why do we have the highest rates? Their profit is our expense. They make a lot of money off that plant. They make millions of dollars every day. That's how they can afford to buy politicians. They fund local elections, little tiny county elections. They put a million dollars into it. All right? That's a huge amount compared to what most politicians spend on a little county election. And of course, the Supreme Court said, put as much as you want. You don't have to tell anybody about it. And so, for example, John Hall got put in by a, uh, a somebody from the House of Representatives, I don't even mention her name, who said that the accident in Fukushima was like a car accident. Like a car accident, right? When you're, when you're in Entergy's pocket, you have to say things like that, I guess, in order to justify your existence to them or, or whatever, or, or just to deal with it yourself. How in the world can you call Fukushima like a car accident? Who said that? It's a Republican congresswoman from, uh, from northern Westchester. Um, I don't think she deserves to be mentioned. <laughs> really? I mean, I don't mention the guy who killed John Lennon. I'm not going to mention that idiot either. All right? Um, I think she's a bigger idiot. Um, but, you know, and, and this is how she's justified at a, at a community meeting, you know, in Westchester. Um, but this is the kind of people we have to deal with. Um, what comes out of a nuclear power plant in these daily routine uh, releases? And what comes out all at once, if there's an accident, uh, the four major things I'm going to talk about are strontium-90, cesium-137, iodine-131, and tritium. Tritium is radioactive hydrogen. Hydrogen is in almost everything. Right? I mean, you know, it's, it's in water, it's in, in every cell in your body, it's everywhere. Um, so anywhere that the tritium is, if it gets into your body in all the different ways, whether it lands on food and you eat it, whether you breathe it directly, whether it lands in the water, because the Croton Reservoir is nearby, that's 
of New York City's water, and the Kensico Grove Reservoir is about 15 miles away. Uh, that's 90% of, of New York City's water, 80% of Westchester's water. So you could drink it. Yes. Now the routine releases may go in a different direction. Uh, it may go down the Hudson, it may go into New Jersey, it may go upstate. Depends on how the wind blows. And we you know wind changes direction. Strontium-90 um, has the same valence as calcium. Uh, uh, if, you, if you remember periodic charts when you were in high school, uh, chem class or something, um, elements that have similar properties are in the same column. Strontium and calcium are in the same column. They, have, they combine with other elements the same way. When your body ingests uh, strontium, it sort of goes, oh, calcium, and puts it wherever it puts the calcium, so your body will take the strontium. Now you have strontium-9, a beta emitter, in your bones. That's where leukemia comes from. Remember, daily releases. Cesium-137, that goes where potassium and sodium go when you ingest them. And they especially hit your uh, muscles and your reproductive organs. That's where the birth defects come from. Uh, iodine-131 goes to your thyroid gland. That's the whole thing about Ki, potassium iodine. So if you take it first, uh, your, uh, your body will go, I don't need more iodine, and it'll flush it out through your kidneys. So you'll have the radioactive iodine in your kidneys for a short time, and it'll be gone. Uh, but there's nothing to stop the other stuff from coming in, staying in, and do what it wants. I remember hitchhiking in 79 upstate New York, and I had got a ride with somebody from the NRC. And it was a few months after Three Mile Island. So he asked me what I thought of Three Mile Island. I said it was, it was horrible. So then he gives me a high school physics lesson. I guess he figures who, who knows physics, right? And he said that the main three kinds of, of things that come out of anything radioactive, alpha particles, beta particles, and gamma radiation. An alpha particle is a little helium nuclei. And this piece of paper will stop, all right, an alpha particle. All right, so if you shot an alpha particle at me, and it would, a piece of paper would, would stop it. It would take a bit of wood about yay thick to stop beta. And gamma, you need lead shielding, you know, concrete three feet deep. However, that's high school physics. All right, you keep shooting alpha particles at this. Where are the alpha particles? Some of them are melting off. Most of them are being absorbed. So after a little while, this is radioactive. So you can't shield it from that for any length of time because your very shielding will become radioactive. There's a place in New Jersey that they buried some of the waste from the Manhattan Project. I'm reading about this in the Sierra Club waste paper when I was first with the Shadow Alliance. And what, what happens is that the, they put the waste in a barrel, then they put the barrel and they put it in the ground. Well, what happens is that eventually the barrel becomes radioactive and the ground becomes radioactive. So every 10 years or so, they would uh, unbury the barrel, put the waste in a new barrel, take the soil <coughs> and the waste, and make, now that's radioactive waste, and they'd cut that off. And then they'd bring in new soil and rebury the original nuclear waste. They did that in 59, 67, and 80. 80 is when I joined the Shadow Alliance. And I'm reading these articles, and I'm going, whoa used to live near this plant. And then I give the address. And I'm going, I used to play there. I used to hop the fence and I used to play there. Um, you know, you're 10 years old, right? It says keep out. And you go, oh, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> 10 year old boy, right? Um, 